thank you. So thank you all again for coming to another installment in the uh, pro seminar series for the Department of Gender Policy. Got it. Oh, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Uh, so uh, for those of you who haven't been before, so we've been doing these all throughout the semester, we'll continue to do them into the spring. It's a great opportunity to invite folks from across the different subfields of anthropology. Today continues to be part of that. We are joined by Dr. Brianna Pobener. Dr. Pobener is a paleoanthropologist who holds a PhD in anthropology from Rutgers University. Since 2008, she has served as both the associate research professor at George Washington University and a research scientist and museum an educator in the Human Origins Program at the Smithsonian Institute. Dr. Boner's research focuses on the evolution of human diet with special attention paid to meat eating practices. And this research has taken her to a variety of field sites, including Kenya, Tanzania, South Africa, and Indonesia. Uh, her publications are too numerous to list in their entirety, so I'll just highlight a couple, one being the most recent, a co-author chapter titled the Zoo Archaeology of Pleistocene Africa, published in the Handbook of Pleistocene Archaeology, Hominid Behavior, Geography, and Chronology, so that's 2023. And then also one that i just like to do a special spotlight for, a title or a chapter titled Teaching Biological Anthropology, Pedagogy of Human Evolution and Human Variation in the 2023 Companion to Biological Anthropology. It's a fascinating bit of work, a timely bit of writing too. It really dwells on the unusual low rate or the acceptance of evolution, in particular human evolution in the U.S. compared to other parts of the global north, as well as the pervasive nature of genetic essentialism. What I also like about that chapter is it's not just a listing of all the problems, but actually offers some practical advice how you might actually go about addressing these, say, in undergraduate courses. So if you haven't read it, maybe check it out. And much like her publications, Dr. Povener's list of grants, fellowships, and awards are numerous, including notables from Fulbright Hayes, the National Science Foundation, multiple Wintergren Foundation awards. And in 2021, she received both the American Association of Biological Anthropologists and Leakey Foundation Communication and Outreach Award in honor of Camilla Smith and the National Center for Science Education's Friend of Darwin Award, probably the best named award I've heard in <laughs> Friend of Darwin. Uh, so needless to say, we're quite lucky to have them with us here today. The talk is titled The Role of Scavenging Animal Foods in the Evolution of Human Diet. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Brianna Fogler. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and I always love to hear when someone has read one of my articles or book chapters. So I really appreciate that. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen. I'm hoping that actually I sorted it out so that I can... Um, see the screen that I want to see. Let me see what's coming up there. Okay. Yes, perfect. So now you're just seeing my slides. Hooray! Just had to swap monitors. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and I am happy to actually answer questions at any time, although I don't know what the usual procedure is. So I'm just going to kind of keep going and it seems like maybe questions at the end will work better. Um, I, um, I always like to start off with an image of this bronze sculpture, which is in our Hall of Human Origins at the Natural History Museum at the Smithsonian. Um, and this is a Homo erectus female carrying kind of a goat-sized gazelle carcass. And um, all of her artwork, at least all of the hominin sculptures in the Hall of Human Origins, all done by John Gerchi, ask a question. Um, and the question that this sculpture is asking is, did she hunt or scavenge this prey animal? So I would argue that there have been three major significant evolutionary changes in human diets over time. Um, the first one is the incorporation of eating food from big animals starting somewhere around 3 million years ago. And I'll talk a little bit about some of that earliest evidence. Um, the second major one is starting to cook food. Um, and that happened about a million years ago. I'm not gonna dive into that in this talk, but um, that was a really significant change because cooking both plant and animal foods makes more types of foods more physically and chemically available and accessible for us to digest. And then the last one was the domestication of edible plants and animals starting somewhere around 12,000 years ago. Fun fact, the earliest plant and animal domesticated, both of them were not actually edible, um, but the really the domestication of edible plants and animals was um, a major like turning point in, the, in our history and prehistory, but also had a major impact on our planet. 
Okay. So what makes early human carnivory, and by that I mean like eating meat and other um, tissues from animals, what makes that unique compared to what we see in our closest living relatives, chimpanzees and um, other apes? So one is that it involves tool use. So even a couple of million years ago, um, early humans or hominins didn't have super sharp teeth. Um, and um, very strong jaws in the same sense that uh, carnivores do to enable them to be able to just use their mouths to get at food. So this is a really nice illustration um, done by our 2D artist for the Hall of Human Origins, Karen Carr. And she's illustrating a elephant butchery scene at a prehistoric site in Kenya called Olorgosile. Um, and those hominins are using tools to butcher that elephant. Um, it also included um, eating meat and marrow and other resources from big animals. So we do see um, the utilization of smaller animals among our closest living ape relatives, um, but that the earliest signs we see of carnivory in the prehistoric record includes animals much bigger than the hominins themselves. A third uh, um, aspect is what we call deferred consumption. So humans are weird. Um, we don't go into a grocery store, uh, basically open all the packages, sit on the floor and start eating. So that's weird compared to other animals. Most other animals eat food as soon as they encounter it, but we don't. Um, humans, you know, go to a grocery store, put things in our cart, go back to our houses, put it away um, and bring it out later to share with maybe our family, um, maybe other extended members of our social group and maybe total strangers. So that deferred consumption, not eating things as soon as we find it, we can actually see aspects of that pretty early in the archeological record. Um, and the last one is scavenging. So there have been very few observations of scavenging in other apes, um, a handful in chimpanzees. I think maybe, um, I don't think there have been any observations of scavenging in gorillas, maybe one in gorillas and none in orangutans that I'm aware. Um, so this is something that seems to be also unique, and we could see this in the fossil record as well. So if I was going to give you a menu of evidence for all of the ways that we can investigate meat eating in general in um, human prehistory, I would include the diets of chimpanzees and our other closest living relatives. I would include studies of human foragers. Um, I would look at zooarchaeology, the um, archaeological remains associated with um, sites that preserve evidence of human behavior, and actualistic studies, and those are the two things I'll be talking about today, studies of the present to understand the past. We might also be able to look at early human fossils themselves, the archaeological record or tools, um, even sometimes ancient molecules, relevant ones where they're preserved, and plant microfossils. And this is actually about human um, diets in general, not just meat eating. So I'm really gonna focus on zooarchaeology and actualistic studies. Um, so I'm gonna start with framing the hunting scavenging debate. So questions about the timing, the frequency, the resource yield, and the behavioral and biological implications of acquiring animal foods in our prehistory have been part of this debate as it's been framed in the paleoanthropological scholarly literature for decades. Um, hunting, um, or at least correlates of hunting, have, were invoked a few decades ago, starting a few decades ago, to explain the origins of everything from bipedalism, walking upright on two legs, to the origins of technology, to adaptations to open grasslands. Um, and there were two books that were really influential, particularly this one, and this is a book called Man the Hunter. This was published in 1968, and this was a collection of papers presented at a 1966 symposium that included research done among the hunting and gathering peoples of the world. And this outlined both ethnographic and some archaeological evidence for these ideas about the primacy of hunting. And then also in 1971, um, Jane Goodall's observations of chimpanzee hunting were published. So this idea also found some support in studies of apes as well. Um, but really the idea of hunting being important in human evolutionary history, as well as some zooarchaeological evidence for this behavior, at least at first, really has deeper roots. Um, with Raymond Dart in the 1940s and 50s, who was a um, paleoanthropologist in South Africa. And he um, 
proposed what's called the osteodontokeratic or the bone ho tooth horn culture. Um, wait, hold on. Um, in the late 1940s and 50s. And what he did was suggest that the patterns of breakage in animal bones found at fossil sites in South Africa where stone tools were not also found, um, but also some, some of those sites had the remains of Australopithecus africanus. Um, and he interpreted this as um, that those patterns of breakage were the result of these early humans or hominins breaking bones to use as tools and weapons. Um, Robert Ardry, who was an American playwright and science writer, visited South Africa in 1955. He became really enamored with this idea, um, and it led to um, the killer ape hypothesis, which was outlined in his book, um, African Genesis, in 1961. Um, and this really, you know, supported the idea that hominins were bloodthirsty, gruesome, savage, and maybe even cannibalistic hunters. So um, this was also a best-selling book, thinking about how these ideas started to pervade American culture. All right, so were hominins hunting right from the beginning of when we see stone hunting technology? Um, no. So the earliest solid evidence for hunting technology is not archaeologically visible until about half a million years ago. So the image you see on the right are spear points from a site in South Africa called Katupan, um, and they have what are called diagnostic impact fractures, indicating experimentally that they were definitely used as the tips of weapons. Yes, it could be that hunting occurred um, using unmodified rocks, using sharpened sticks made into spears or other archeologically invisible tools, but we don't have a way to detect that in the archeological record at this time. So in 1981, two books had a significant impact on initiating this debate um, or shifting it a little bit. Um, this one on the left uh, by Bob Brain called The Hunters or the Hunted. Um, and he used comparisons with modern carnivore den assemblages to reinterpret those breakage patterns that were proposed by DART as the result of um, carnivore activity. So that's how he reinterpreted them as opposed to being the result of human butchery behavior. There was also a book in 1981 called um, uh, by Lewis Binford called Bones, Ancient Men and Modern Myths. Um, he also challenged the assumption that broken bones always means human behavior. Um, and he presented detailed data on taphonomic patterns on bones resulting from the butchery and consumption of prey by Nunamiat foragers of Alaska. He also looked at um, data from wolf dens and the um, breakage patterns there. And he was basically comparing and contrasting patterns of bone breakage and bone surface modifications created by humans and non-human predators. So what about the zooarchaeological record? One of the main behavioral traces of butchery that zooarchaeologists study, in addition to skeletal part profiles, the, the what bones are there, and also bone breakage patterns, is bone surface modifications. Um, so looking here, we're looking at cut marks, those were produced by the contact of sharp edge tools on bones. Um, they were recognized in 1981 on early Stone Age assemblages, although they were recognized earlier than that on other assemblages. Um, and then this is, these are both scanning electron microscope photos, by the way. This is a percussion mark, and those marks are produced during the process of breaking open bones with a hammer stone, with basically just any kind of rounded natural rock to access the marrow inside. Um, those were recognized on early Stone Age fossil assemblages in 1988. Um, so cut marks were initially interpreted as indicating access to fully fleshed carcasses, um, but other research later on showed that cut marks could be the result of access to also maybe just scraps of meat from um, carcasses left over from carnivore consumption. So I'm gonna summarize like a couple decades of work in this one slide, so bear with me. Um, so beginning in the 1980s, um, several researchers conducted actualistic studies with the aim of producing frameworks to determine whether the frequency and location of cut and percussion and carnivore tooth marks in different experimental scenarios could, um, uh, were basically, were reproducing different um, 
basically order of access to carcasses by hominins or humans and carnivores. Um, and so they generally looked at limb bone mid shafts when calculating the frequencies of bone surface modifications. So when only humans have access to bones and modify them, cut marks, that's at CM, are recorded on somewhere between five and 40% of those mid shafts of limb bones, the arm and leg bones. Percussion marks are recorded on between about 10 and 35% of those limb bones. When first hominins are breaking open bones to get at the marrow inside and leaving hammerstone marks, followed by carnivore access, the percussion mark frequency decreases to less than 20% because those carnivores crunch up some of the bones that had percussion marks on them. And when carnivores get there first and hominins come in afterwards, basically a scavenging scenario, those cut mark frequencies decrease to about 10%. Um, interestingly, though, so this is just looking at frequencies of hominin created marks on these limb bone mid shafts. But um, later research has shown that anatomical location might actually be more important to understand the order of access than those frequencies of marks themselves. But um, let's use those frequencies of marks in those experiments and apply them to the fossil record. Um, so the earliest evidence for hominin butchery comes from a handful of sites in Eastern Africa. And I'm gonna describe the earliest three um, that go back to before 2 million years ago. Um, you see evidence on the left from the site of Dikika in Ethiopia, um, where there are a few um, fossil bones that have um, been claimed to have butchery marks on them. They're, they're pretty highly contested. Those marks might've been made by um, other things. Um, Nyayanga in the middle, which is dated to 2.9 million years ago, and that site is in Kenya. Dikika is in Ethiopia, in case I forgot to mention it. Um, this site was published last year, um, and there are two hippos and two antelopes butchered there, 12 total bones with butchery marks on them, um, potentially in two separate butchery events, which is interesting. Um, and then there's two other sites in Ethiopia. I have images from one here called Buri, the other one is Gona, um, that have a handful of butchery mark fossils. So, but really before 2 million years ago, there are 45 bones, fossil bones at four sites, um, including actually a site in Algeria that have um, butchery marked that have butchery marks on them. Um, it looks like basically before about 2 million years ago, there's occasional hominin carnivory. This was likely not a very important part of our dietary behavior before about 2 million years ago. At 2 million years ago, there may be somewhat of a turning point. Um, and so we have what's called the first evidence of persistent hominin carnivory, and I'll explain what that means. This evidence comes from Kanjara South in Western Kenya. Um, and at Kanjara, there's clear evidence of hundreds of butchery mark bones um, from numerous relatively complete small animal carcasses that were processed by hominins, um, and that they got to these animals first before other predators got there. They seem to have had at least occasional access to meat and marrow from large animals, maybe scavenging those larger animals, having earlier access to the smaller animals. And the big difference between this site and those earlier sites that I mentioned is that there's evidence for hominin butchery on bones from three different stratigraphic intervals at Kanjara, which span hundreds to thousands of years. And this is why I was involved in the analysis of these fossils. This is why we call this persistent hominin carnivory. Hominins are coming back, to the same place over and over again to butcher animals. This gives us a sense that this dietary behavior may be becoming more important or at least more common. By 1.5 million years ago, maybe 1.8 million years ago, there seems to be another shift. And there is from several different bone assemblages from places like Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania and Kubifora in Kenya. There are hundreds of butchered bones. There's evidence from the skeletal parts that are there that animal carcasses, or at least parts of carcasses, were transported um, to places where hominins were basically processing them. Um, these photos are from butchery marks on a 1.5 million year old fossil antelope leg bone from Kubifor in northern Kenya. This is part of an assemblage that I studied for my dissertation. Um, and there's a lot of evidence for butchery, although interestingly, it could be for there's not 
really a preference for certain sized animal bones, certain sized animals or certain bones or even specific parts of the animal. Um, so it looks like even at this point, hominids are still like really thoroughly butchering the carcasses that they're able to get um, their hands on. So this debate still continues though, this hunting scavenging debate. Um, and really in the last two decades um, or more than that, it's largely focused on exchanges over interpretation of a very well-preserved fauna from the site of FLK 22 or FLK Zinjanthropus um, from Bed Walnut Olduvai Gorge dated to about 1.84 million years ago. So on one side of the continuum, Lewis Binford originally proposed that the patterns that he saw on of the skeletal parts and also the um, butchery marks indicated that hominins were marginal scavengers of only flesh scraps and maybe some marrow left over from carnivore kills and that hominins were not a very important part of creating this um, archaeological site. Henry Bunn, on the other hand, suggested that these patterns indicated that hominins were competent hunters, at least of smaller sized prey. Um, they may have been aggressively scavenging larger prey, interrupting feeding predators and basically taking what remained of their meals. And that hominins were the major accumulators of this fossil assemblage. Um, in 1988, um, Rob Blumenschein entered the debate in a sense um, and also included looking at percussion marks and tooth marks um, and concluded that hominids may have been scavenging a lot of those larger fauna. Um, Blumenschein also had a series of PhD students in the late 1990s, including Sal Capaldo and Marie Salvaggio, who did experimental taphonomy, some of those um, models that I mentioned before about the frequencies of cut marks and percussion marks and tooth marks. Um, and then they applied their findings to that FLK Zinge assemblage. Um, other researchers started to chime in, especially Manuel Dominguez Rodrigo of Complutense University in Madrid. Um, and I would say, while well, zooarchaeologists continue to really disagree about how to interpret the evidence from FLK 22, um, they, um, they largely agree, and this is the most recent um, uh, analysis published by Jennifer Parkinson, what they do agree on is that um, most of the bones found at the site were transported there by hominins and that hominins and carnivores extracted nutrients from the carcasses there, including meat and marrow. The big disagreement still is whether hominins there had access to carcasses with a lot of meat on them or not a lot of meat on them. Um, so this is what the agreement is, and this is what the disagreement is still at this point. So let me just have a side note to say, is Homo erectus even really that carnivorous? So early archaeological sites preserving evidence of carnivory obviously predate the evolution of Homo erectus, which evolved a little after 2 million years ago, around one point, well, actually at this point, about 2 million years ago. Um, but we really see these larger, well-preserved, big accumulations of butchery mark bones after the arrival of Homo erectus. Um, and this has kind of supported the, this idea that meat made us human, um, that basically, you know, eating meat was a really important part of our evolutionary history and that this shift happened around 2 million years ago. Um, but until last year, data from across sites in Eastern Africa really hadn't been quantitatively synthesized to test this hypothesis. So I was involved in research with Andrew Barr, John Rowan, Andrew Dew, and Tyler Faith. Um, and we basically looked at all of the evidence for butchery mark bones across Eastern Africa and compared it to just the amount of fossil evidence from these time periods in general. Um, and it turned out that basically the relative amount uh, uh, or amount of evidence for carnivory does not show an, an increase with sort of a sustained increase um, after the appearance of Homo erectus. So that is the title of our paper at PNAS. Um, so, you know, still, still, I think a question mark out there about whether this big shift really occurred with Homo erectus. Okay, so if um, hominids were not hunting these prey animals, these big prey animals that they butchered, um, maybe they were scavenging them. Um, and two main modes of scavenging have been proposed for hominids. One is passive, um, and that's basically waiting until predators are completely finished eating their prey, um, coming in and getting what's left over. 
the assumptions about passive scavenging is that there would be um, a marginal amount and a marginal quality of animal tissue. Not a lot left and not in, not in such good shape, basically. There's also a um, suggestion of confrontational scavenging. That's chasing predators off of kills while they're basically interrupting them before they're finished. Um, this is assumed to yield ample amounts of various animal tissues, but including pretty high quality animal tissues, maybe parts of the guts, you know, maybe big muscle masses. Um, so let's talk about some previous studies of passive scavenging. Um, and as I mentioned, these assumptions are that passive scavenging would only yield opportunistic infrequent access to carcasses, probably to nutritionally marginal amounts of food that may have been pathogenic or putrefied. Um, and two main varieties of passive scavenging have been hypothesized. Um, the first is scavenging from temporarily abandoned kills of solitary predators, including tree-stored leopard kills, um, but basically between feeding bouts. And there's been one pilot study done on this by um, John Cavallo and Rob Blumenschein. They looked at tree-stored leopard kills in the Serengeti in Tanzania. Um, they only looked at three basically goat-sized antelope carcasses, but they observed that they persisted as scavengeable food resources for about 28 hours. So that exceeds the duration of any persistence of scavengeable resources of killed by terrestrial predators. Um, and so they also found that they were more predictably located and they were less seasonal than terrestrial kills. They required low search effort, no pursuit effort. You don't have to chase them down. Um, but I would say that really the potential animal tissue yields from this type of resource hasn't been extensively investigated or quantified. So I think there's still more work to be done here. Um, the second passive scavenging niche that had been proposed, so tree store leopard kills and permanently abandoned kills of either solitary or social terrestrial felids. So we're talking about lions and probably saber tooth cats, which obviously are not around anymore. Um, and felids are assumed to be probably the optimal predators to scavenge from is because they don't access, they don't crunch up bones like hyenas and even some canids like wolves and, and larger um, canids. And the larger the carcass, the less likely they are to be able to get at those within bone resources, things like marrow and brains. Um, and this has been assumed though, that basically if you're scavenging from big cats, there would only be a small amount of abandoned flesh and probably all the marrow from these abandoned felid kills of medium-sized adult herbivores. Um, and so um, Blumenschein outlined a couple of variables that might be able to affect the quality of a scavenging opportunity. That includes the size of the carcass, the habitat that the carcass is found in, the initial consumer type who ate it first, and as I mentioned, you know, cats versus hyenas or, or dogs or canids would make a big difference. And then the predator prey ratio of the ecosystem. Um, that can change seasonally in places where herbivores migrate um, and that can affect the level of competition for carcasses. We might be able to get at some of these in the fossil record, at least theoretically we could. So what have previous studies of this type of passive scavenging um, shown? So Rob Blumenschein did one of these studies in the mid 1980s in the Serengeti and Ngorongoro ecosystems in Tanzania. Um, and he found that carcass availability was highest in the dry season and in riparian woodlands. So that's basically the woodlands along rivers or water courses. Um, Martha Tappan did a study in the mid 1990s. It wasn't really strictly a scavenging study, but some of her results can be kind of used for this type of um, research. She was in a wet savanna ecosystem in the Virunga National Park in Zaire, and she found it had year-round carcass availability in open floodplains, particularly not so much in riparian forests. Manuel Dominguez Rodrigo in the late 1990s did a study in the Masai Mara in Kenya, which is essentially the same ecosystem as the Serengeti in Tanzania. It just happens to be on the other side of the border. Um, he found that um, carcasses in riparian woodlands hardly had any scraps of flesh at all, which is different than what Blumenschein saw. In his sample, all of his flesh scraps were on carcasses in open plains. 
Um, Agnes Gidna in the late 2000s did a study in a different ecosystem in Tarangiri National Park in Tanzania. She found that most of the carcasses consumed by lions on the open plains were pretty defleshed. And the carcasses consumed in bushy plains and in gallery forests had more flesh remaining on abandonment. So these studies are not giving us a consistent pattern of where we might see um, scavenging opportunities. So um, I did a passenger, I did a passive passenging, passive scavenging study um, in a in a different ecosystem um, as part of my dissertation. Um, so I spent seven months in a private game reserve in Kenya, now called Olpegeta Conservancy. This was between 2002 and 2003. Um, I went there to simulate passive scavenging, um, but I was particularly interested in this ecosystem because it was lion dominated with few spotted hyenas. So the Serengeti, Ngorongoro, Masai Mara, tend to have high numbers of spotted hyenas, which are bone crunchers. And I was interested in going to a place where felids, where the big cats were dominant, kind of as a model for pre, um, past ecosystems where we might find high um, proportions of saber-toothed cats. So I thought this was a good model for that type of ecosystem. So my study methods were pretty um, simple. I would find out about a carnivore kill from a variety of sources. I would wait until the lions were totally done. Remember, I was simulating passive scavenging. Um, here's a good example of lions totally done, although unfortunately for me, sitting in the middle of the road. Um, so these are two young male lions that hunted together a lot. Um, the one on the left who's showing his belly, um, his belly is really full of warthog. He seems to be in a very happy place. Um, then I would go in and document what was left on their kills. Um, so, I mean, maybe I didn't simulate passive scavenging. I had a four wheel drive vehicle. I had an armed guard with me. Um, I definitely didn't want to simulate confrontational scavenging and I didn't want to become one of my own samples. So this seems safe to me. So in the time, in the seven months that I was at Olpegeta, I collected 24 kill samples from different species of carnivores. You can see the, the um, predator species on the left column of that table but I particularly wanna focus on lions today. It's my largest sample and I really think it's the most relevant thinking about scavenging opportunities. So I separated the prey into large and small prey sizes based on how we divide prey in the archeological record. So larger animals are over 250 pounds. So that includes zebras, bigger antelope like buffalo or eland. Um, smaller animals were less than 250 pounds. Um, at Olpegeta, those are things like smaller antelope like Impala, Grant's Gazelle, Thompson's Gazelle, as well as Warthog. Um, and then I documented the location and estimated the amount of meat left over after the lions were done. So this is what some of those looked like. The top right picture is a zebra rib cage that has most of its meat left on it. The bottom picture is part of a, a limb of a young Grant's Gazelle that hardly even has any meat scraps left on it. So I use the definition of bulk scrap, bulk flesh and flesh scraps that were um, defined by previous researchers. So flesh scraps had to have less than 10% of the original amount of flesh left, including only small packets of flesh still adhering to the bone. This was the definition, approximately less than the size of a human's palm in area, but larger than two to three centimeters and 150 grams. So basically a flesh scrap is a little bit of meat that is still worth going after is I guess how I would, how I would um, term it. So what did I find? How much meat could a passive scavenger eat from large prey? Before I show you the data, I'm gonna walk you through the graph. So um, on the X axis, is the skeletal element or bone arranged in groups from left to right. The total sample size is in parentheses. The first group on the left is hind limb bones, femur and tibia. Then we have forelimb bones. Then we have bones of the axial skeleton of the torso. And then we have bones of the head. And on the Y axis is the proportion of those bones in all samples with three different levels of flesh availability. You could see that on the bottom. No flesh, that's red, it's colored like a stoplight, no flesh, no good. Um, flesh scraps is yellow um, and green is bulk flesh. So for large kills, you see a lot of green and yellow. Um, over 50% of the individual bones in large kills were abandoned with big muscle masses still on them. 
and 95% of bones had either bulk or flesh scrap. So that's the yellow plus the green. Um, so pretty good for a passive scavenger. What about small prey? Not great. Um, so only a single bone on the smaller kills of lions had bulk flesh. About half of the bones had some scraps of flesh and the other half were totally defleshed. So this supports one of Blumenshine's proposals that the size of a carcass makes a really big difference as, in terms of a scavenging opportunity. So how do we translate this into something more sort of tangible? How much meat could this passive scavenger eat? So we can use the weights of an adult wildebeest pictured here. This is a common size of animals found in the archeological record. So if we use an estimate of four calories per gram of meat, um, we have, oh, sorry, before we do that, um, a, the, a fully fleshed hind limb of a wildebeest is about 19 pounds. A defleshed hind limb, less than, uh, you know, around 10% is about two pounds. A whole defleshed carcass might be 12 pounds of meat. Um, so using four calories per gram of meat, that's 2,200 calories from a defleshed wildebeest or from one that only has flesh scraps. So what does that mean? That's almost 24 McDonald's burger patties from a defleshed wildebeest. Um, what does that mean for our Homo erectus scavenger? So a single larger sized carcass killed by lions and abandoned with only flesh scraps still could have been substantial enough to meet the total daily caloric requirement of at least one female Homo erectus estimated at about 2,100 calories per day. That's without breaking any bones to get at the marrow inside. Marrow from the 12 major long bones from a non-fat depleted adult wildebeest yields about 3,000 kilocalories, which would have more than satisfied the daily caloric requirement of another Homo erectus within about 30 minutes of processing time. So the net yields of extracting brain and flesh can be even higher, sometimes by two orders of magnitude. So I think it's time to reframe this debate. Um, really at the root of this debate though are important questions about the significant evolutionary consequences of the changes in hominin behavior and ecology with the dietary shift to acquiring, consuming, and sharing animal tissues. Here are some interesting questions we can ask. Is there a functional association between early Stone Age artifacts and fossil animal bones found together at prehistoric sites? When did hominins begin to eat tissues from animals larger than themselves? Which hominin is raiding these animals? I'm not sure we can actually get it an answer to that question. Um, how likely is it that the earliest animal tissue consumption included scavenging? What kinds of animals were being butchered and eaten? In what landscape settings? In what habitats and what seasons? How often did consumption of animal tissues occur? How much did animal tissue consumption contribute to the diet relative to other foods? When did animal tissues become a common um, or important part of the hominin diet? How predictable was the availability and acquisition of animal foods by hominins? And finally, did animal tissue consumption lead to food sharing among hominins? This was some of the earlier questions that were asked about kind of the implications, behavioral implications of this dietary shift. Um, modern humans exhibit a much higher degree of food sharing and intra-group cooperation during food obtaining activities than any other primate. And sharing meat in particular, a high quality protein rich food may have led to increased overall consumption of animal tissues by hominins, which has been proposed as a driver of biological changes during human evolution such as body size increase, brain size expansion, behavioral changes, including the development of a sexual division of labor and paternal investment in mates and offspring. So I think next steps, we should examine more fossils of animals to look for some, some of these butchery marks. We need to develop better taphonomic models. Um, some of those models that I mentioned in the beginning, we still, I think there are questions about what the frequency and location of butchery marks actually mean. Um, and also develop more methods in order to be able to more confidently identify these marks. I think um, observing more small felid kills and natural death assemblages um, as potential scavenging opportunities, I think that's an underdeveloped part of this kind of scavenging research agenda. 
I think conducting experiments on carcass tissue edibility persistence, basically, how long do these tissues stay edible before they get putrefied, before they get like, you know, basically not, not consumable anymore? Oops. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think these are, are some of the kind of next steps in trying to move forward with uh, questions about um, the role of scavenging in human evolution. So particularly for that scavenging study, I want to acknowledge research permission by the government of Kenya, funding from these different funding agencies for my um, research plans overall, um, and support for that scavenging study I did as a um, graduate student from the National Museums of Kenya, Old Pejeta Conservancy, my PhD advisor, and my postdoc advisor. And I will stop there so that I can answer some questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Bovener. If you can't hear the, the applause, just to reiterate, the applause was there, so very much appreciated. And I think it was also there for the little jokes along the way. I had you on mute, so there was laughter when it was appropriate. So, uh, thank you very much. So we have a good amount of time, uh, luckily. So for folks in the room, if you have any questions, please feel free to go. Hey, Brianna, this is Brian. Good talk. Hello, thank you. Be, uh, reassess the speed at which I talk in my lectures. Well, I, you know, I'm definitely, I don't talk slowly and I know I probably need to slow down a little bit. So no, it's perfect. <laughs> I apologize. It's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, I was wondering if you um, would be willing to speculate uh, about this idea that um, eating meat relaxes a constraint on brain <clears throat> development and evolution, considering you're talking about two to 3,000 calories from a carcass, and maybe compare that with what you think would have been what's going on with, let's say, Australopithecus. Yeah, it's a good question. And um, it's funny, I'm looking at like the video of me, and it looks very like washed out. Sorry about that. Um, it's not that bright in here today. Um, so the idea that eating meat relaxed a constraint on the evolution of brain size, was that was that sort of the key, the core part of your question? Yeah, sure. yeah so I think it's an interesting idea. Um, and, you know, this is part of the expensive tissue hypothesis, the idea that, you know, that the eating meat, um, uh, the two most expensive tissues in our body, energetics wise, our brains, as well as our guts, and that um, there was a constraint on the evolution of larger brains um, until we could basically figure out or until hominins started acquiring meat from like some kind of high quality food resource, um, you know, maybe like meat, and that that um, was a way that guts basically decreased from a more chimp-like gut to a human-like gut. Um, the problem is the timing doesn't work very well. So it looks like, at least for, from my understanding, um, that brain size and body size slowly increased kind of in tandem until about a million years ago, maybe a little bit older than that. And then you see this really big increase in brain size. So I don't see good support of the idea that eating meat relaxed this constraint and that brain size, even starting, you know, three million years ago, maybe even two million years ago, it doesn't look like there's a sort of big uptick up uptick in relative brain size. So that's where I think the it's a it's an interesting hypothesis, but right now I don't think the timing adds up as far as the evidence we see in the zooarchaeological zoarche record and the paleoanthropological record. Thank you. Uh, hi, Dr. Pavano. This is this is Dan Benichuk. I'm a faculty member here. First of all, thank you for really uh, a really interesting, uh, engaging talk. So I've got a quick follow up to that. Okay, so if the timing doesn't work for that, especially given what you said in your intro about what you think is uh, where you first have cooking, is that the thing that re relaxes uh, um, essentially the, the constraints on brain size? I mean, this is Rangham's article. Of course, he pushes yeah. it back to two million years. But I know. so if you if you buy the one million years for cooking, do you think that is what then allows for essentially a lot more nutrients uh, to be absorbed. And I think, release. yeah, I think right now that is probably the best um, uh, argument out there. Um, I would see, like I said, the earliest solid evidence for cooking at about a million years ago. 
um, from Wonderwork Cave in South Africa, not long after that from Gesher Benat Yaakov in Israel dating to, you know, a little less than 800,000 years ago. I know that there have been claims at other sites a little bit earlier. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think not only cooking meat, but also cooking plants, you know, maybe being able to roast underground storage organs. So right now, cooking kind of has my my vote. Um, yeah. Quick follow up. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your sense of uh, in the uh, I've talked to Brian about this a little bit. What, what's your sense of in the Paleoanth community, uh, the agreement that a million years is probably really solid evidence that there's that there's large scale uh, consensus among paleoanthropologists that this is when con controlled fire and cooking. Yeah, I don't know that there's large scale consensus among paleoanthropologists about anything. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, I would, <laughs> but I would say, um, I think there is pretty good consensus that the evidence is solid starting at a million years ago. I think the evidence gets really solid for like repeated strong controlled use of fire, maybe about starting about 400, 500,000 years ago. I think there's probably a dearth of evidence in that like million to half a million year range. So absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence, but, um, but yeah, I think that, that, um, yeah, I don't, uh, you know, it's, I'm not so plugged into the community looking at fire, but my sense is that um, among like paleoanthropologists in general, I think that's decently widespread consensus for whatever that can be. Right. Thank you. Sure. Well, I have a, a general question, I guess, as an archaeologist, um, the models you present for behavior and strategies, are they always an either or scenario where it's either passive, um, passive scavenging or, uh, you know, aggressive confrontational scavenging, either scavenging or hunting or is some of the variability that you were citing a reflection of a much more complicated range of activities that maybe, you know, all of these things are happening. Is that possible? And is there any way to make that argument based on the zooarchaeological signatures, the kind of archaeological context you're looking at? Yeah, that's an awesome question. I think the basic answer is yes. I think it's all of the above. Um, I think a lot of times what we try to do with experimental or actualistic studies is we try to control as many variables as possible and then say, what patterns do we see? Um, and then when we look at the archaeological record, we're like, oh, we see these messy patterns. And I think the reason for that is that it is very unlikely, except maybe for sites where you seem to, you know, it might be like a one off or like a single use occupation. I think when you have sites that have accumulated over a longer period of time, you're really likely to see these different foraging strategies or carcass acquisition strategies. Um, so yeah, I think that's exactly why we see these messier patterns in a sense in the zooarchaeological record is because I think that, you know, hominin foraging was likely very flexible over season, over time, over space, all kinds of things. So absolutely, yes. Thank you. Yeah, I was taken by your photo where it was lions only. And whenever I'm out looking there, it's like lions in the middle, Hyenas, one ring out behind them are the jackals, various dorks, vultures, and, right, like and the vultures. Sequence like of this thing, and so when hominids would have come in, you can't imagine them chasing away lions, but hyenas, or if there were few hyenas rather than I mean, like you can imagine like slotting in there somewhere <laughs> in a sort of sequence. You know? Well, yeah, I, yeah, but I mean, modern you know modern humans who are hungry will chase lions off of kills you know the hadza in tanzania i think get some like somewhere maybe between i gotta look this up between like 20 and 30 percent of their kills are from scavenging from lions um so it is possible um and i think they're you know potentially knowing where lions are hanging out you know go like in places where there are a lot of trees where the vultures aren't able to basically visually see the carcasses um so i think there there may have been like different kind of ecological scenarios where hominids may have been able to kind of get in there i've certainly been in ecosystems where competition for carcasses is you know incredibly intense but i think um I don't know, our perceptions may be biased by those particular modern ecosystems and thinking about what, uh, you know, different ecological niches were and different kind of like spatial um, differentiation in these different ecosystems, there may have been 
um, maybe more opportunities for hominid scavenging than we think about these high competition settings today. Oh, oh, oh! Sorry about that, Barb. I just, I, I'm curious. Just this discussion made me think about the whole context thing and the complicated uh, things that they were doing. How have people studied you? You mentioned you need more studies of small game. Have people done some of the comparisons? Because I'm thinking, if I'm a hominid, I might not take down a, a large species. But I might take down a warthog or something that's a little bit easier, easier. You know, I say that, right? But something that, that's more doable, especially if I have a group. So have there been any studies of that? I mean, I think there's two ways you might be able to study that. One is looking at modern foragers and getting a sense of what prey they go after and when. And I would say, yes, there have been studies of that. I don't have them at my fingertips, but I think that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it might even be at least studies of kind of what's on the landscape and your like numbers of animals, of living animals, and what proportions of them are in these different prey size categories. The, it's interesting, the other um, kind of prey type that has been posited for, um, you know, it's a question of whether you call it hunting or scavenging, but there are some um, smaller antelope like gazelle that sometimes stash their young like in big tufts of grass and go out to forage and so like you don't need a lot of hunting technology in order to dispatch one of those small baby gazelle that the mom has wandered off and left so there may be also these like specific opportunities for smaller carcasses the reason that um, smaller carcasses in some ways have been understudied I don't know about understudied, but um, where you have hyenas and larger canids like African wild dogs and things like that, they will often like fully consume. And actually, even lions can sometimes quite um, effectively consume smaller carcasses. So whether there would be any smaller carcasses around for scavenging is a big question mark. And also, those wouldn't preserve in the fossil record. Right. Like you would never see a small fossil like that. I mean, very well, rarely. Anyway. Well, well, you might. I mean, certainly, I've seen in in archaeological assemblages where you have fossils of small things like you know smaller gazelle, and whether you'd have like neonates and things like that. Yeah. I think that's a yeah, that's a much less likely scenario exactly and also if you find um until you get transport and accumulation in archaeological sites if you have a hominin you know knocking a baby gazelle on the head and butchering and consuming it the likelihood that you're gonna like get that preserved and have it recognized in the illogical in the archaeological record of like a one you know single carcass butchery activity mm, i think that's going to be pretty rare well i, I Dan Beneshek again, uh, uh, Dr. Bobner. Uh, just getting back to Brian's question earlier about well, where where did uh, uh, where did these early hominins slot into these concentric rings of scavengers? And you pointing out rightly so that there are some modern foragers that do this. Um, I happen to know my colleague Alyssa Crittenden really wanted to be here today for your talk, but she wasn't able to come. Uh, and you cited the Hadza as an example. The thing that strikes me about that is the Hadza are pretty fierce hunters. I mean, really uh, remarkable uh, in their uh, uh, in their acumen. Uh, that's a, quite a bit different, I think, than going back right uh, a million years and thinking about, or a million and a half and thinking about scavengers, perhaps yep. doing the same sort of thing for sure. But yeah, so what did you I comment on that? I was going to say, point taken, absolutely. I'm always really uncomfortable with the idea of just sort of slotting in modern foragers to like, you know, just be wholesale models for like earlier hominids. I, I think there's a lot of that, that can be really problematic. I do think that there is value in using data from studies of modern foragers. I'm, I'm actually, it's too bad that Alyssa couldn't be here because I would have loved to hear her thoughts and questions. Um, but yes, I, you know, that's absolutely a point taken is that, you know, that, that modern foragers who um, also have usually and, and bring to bear much more sophisticated technology right. um, than Homo erectus or other hominids had. Yeah, definitely. 
Thank Can you. I just stand up for Homo erectus for a sec? Uh, it's because my favorite species. So no, I'm no, not right there. Homo erectus. No, they're, they're a favorite of mine as well. But they have some postcranial adaptations that suggest that they had capabilities that uh, Australopithecus didn't have. Body size being a big one, but also the shoulder mm -hmm. organizes away from an arboreal towards something that looks throwy. And it always seemed to me that the ability to project force at a distance would be such a huge sure. advantage to any animal. There's only one other animal that I know of that does it, which is the spitting cobra. And you don't mess with spitting cobra. You don't get close to them, right? Yeah. Uh, we have in Ethiopia, and I always wear glasses in the field because they aim for your eyeballs, you know, when they yeah. scratch you. So, like, yeah. you know, and they put little kids out there um, in East Africa to guard those herds. And, you know, those little kids just have a spear. But that's mm -hmm. enough. A lion is not going to come within 50 feet of some little Maasai boy with a pointy. Right. So you're, you're, you're saying you don't necessarily have to have poison tip bows and arrows. No, no, no. no. Yeah, right. right. So right. I'm yeah. saying is that if no, you I... can project, even if you can throw a yeah. rock at a small gazelle, like, yeah. I mean, high school kids throw 80 miles an hour. And that's that's not even really that dimorphic. I know there are some female pitchers who pitch in college baseball mm -hmm. and they're in the 80s. That will absolutely stun or, you know, something that wouldn't think you were, well, you were that Well, and also, to... if your life and your food depends on it, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, you'll be so, good at it. Yeah. No, I think it's a, it's a very good point taken. I think, unfortunately, we're not, you know, we don't have ways to see in the archaeological record, you know, rocks that were thrown, like wooden spears, except for unusual circumstances. So I do think that's where that, you know, postcranial hominin fossil evidence is really interesting. So absolutely. Need some grad students to just take rocks and see if they can drive away the lions and hyenas from the kills. <laughs> I'm not gonna volunteer for that. Yeah, no, right. Um, it depends how much no. you like your students. No, I'm kidding. Exactly. <laughs> Other folks, we got we got a couple more minutes. Uh, there are no other questions. We'll do another round of applause. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Thank you for the invitation. I apologize for that joke about how much do you like your students, by the way, because obviously we would <laughs> never do that to our students. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Care, thanks for the good questions. I appreciated it. Bye. Bye. -bye.